My name is Darren Marble. I work for the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, the Agricultural Research Service. And our topic today is about vegetative treatment areas. And in this conference, I've learned uh, that there's a lot more people that know a lot more about BTAs than I do. So if I make a mistake, please raise your hand and correct me. I make so many mistakes that it won't surprise me a bit. Um, Tom, are you here today? The, the first speaker, is he here today? Tom Basden talked about the, uh, the Coshocton ARS site in Coshocton, Ohio. Does, does anybody know that site? It was a 70 year research site uh, developed by ARS. Um, and he talked about that we can't as a country afford to do long term research anymore. And so when he said that, I thought, well, that's a chance for me to get in my soapbox. And if we don't start or keep putting money in long term research, we're in trouble. These three or five year grants we get, it's, it's really hard to solve problems. And so whether it's ARS or university research, as scientists, we have to, to fight for that long term. Uh, research money that so we can solve some of the problems uh, that we're facing so that's all for the soapbox um Corey Higgs is a master's student I have and, and I taught her hopefully a little science and she taught me a lot about social issues and uh, some of those relationships where I probably got a lot more than she did uh, she's working on her PhD at North Carolina A&T now Kevin Wagner's at this conference one of the co-authors and he's the one that talked about bacterial source tracking at Texas Hey Kevin and I don't have time to talk about all the good things Kevin does in Texas because it would take up my whole time. I want to emphasize that I'm talking about very small operations in this talk, but they're a very important segment of the, the, the industry because most of the operations in the U.S. are this small size ranging from just a few head up to 100. This project that, that we're working on started after conversations with the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board and the Texas Pork Producers Association because uh, the, these operations of this size are very far under the radar screen, regulatory radar screen now. But there's, I think, legitimate concern that they may pop up on the radar screen. And so the industry wanted to be proactive and develop some alternative waste management techniques um, to get ahead of those potential issues. And I think a sincere appreciation of the need for those small producers to protect water quality. So what is a vegetative treatment area? I'm not going to read that definition to you. It's the NRCS definition um, back in, in 2006. I am talking about vegetative treatment areas, not vegetative treatment systems. And, and from what I understand, a vegetative treatment system usually is a, is a much more highly engineered system and usually involves a very important process of the pre-treatment of solids. And so that's, we're just talking about the vegetative areas below these operations. Um, the previous research, from what I can gather, uh, most of it has been on cattle operations. Um, ours is on um, swine operations. And for the most part, the research has shown that, that these treatment areas are, are effective at reducing both runoff volumes uh, nutrient concentrations and nutrient loads. So the research objectives, and I've got one more that's not on here, and, and uh, I was going to start off with a uh, big manure joke, but but I'm really not that funny of a guy. But the uh, the thing I thought about is I've been around beef cattle all my life, and, and I I would smell like beef manure for a few hours after I was in it. But when I get hog manure on me, why do I smell that way until the next day? I don't understand what the difference is, but I, I can't wash pig manure smell off, and I, and I don't know what the difference is. So that had nothing to do with the research. But the, the question of our research is, on these VTAs, can this standalone VTA effectively uh, take care of water quality? These small mom and pop operations have you know, a few head of animals. They sell mostly show pigs or a few roasters to their neighbors. They don't have time or money for an engineer to design a system for them. And so, but can they, most of them have a little land below their operation, so can that, that land use below their operation be a, an effective waste management technique? So, so one of the questions we evaluated was, can this, this land area below the, the operation effectively control water quality? And then Tom also brought up a point, is talking about benign rural water quality. So even if the, the VTA reduces nutrient concentrations in loads, how does it compare to this ambient, benign, rural land use that everybody just assumes is okay? And so that's another question we wanted to address in this work. Uh, that's Corey, by the way. Um, and I've got quite a few pictures. If you see one that's, uh, if you want a little more explanation on, please interrupt and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. We learned a lot, uh, Corey learned a lot from this Kolsch et al. paper 2006. Um, 
you know, when you're doing research, if you can find a good review paper on your subject, it, it's, a, it's a very valuable one. I think this publication was, was that for her. And it listed a lot of these components that the previous research has shown was important uh, components for VTAs. One of them was pretreatment. I've talked a little bit about that, that, that these VTAs, we, are, we have only one of them has some, what you would call some sort of solids pretreatment. But we spent a lot of time looking for sites and developing sites that, that had sheet flow, um, that we could place a site such that the slope was fairly uniform, not too steep. Um, we certainly looked a lot at sizing. Uh, and we looked at source area to treatment area. Okay, We didn't look a lot at manure volume, and looking back, that'll be a recommendation. We look a lot more at the, the manure volume based on the, the number of head of animals. When you have a, a buffer area below a cornfield, you know, maybe 100 feet wide, and you have what a 5% of the total watershed area is the buffer area. But you'll see as the numbers we're talking about, our BTAs are two to four times bigger than our source mm -hmm. area. So we're really trying to make up for calculations on manure volumes based on size of the BTA. So with all that in mind, um, you can see a schematic of all the, the BTAs. We established BTAs at three different sites. And, and what we focused on based on Colch's recommendation is we wanted to make sure each one of those BTAs had perennial vegetative cover. So they were grass pastures and then we overseeded them with the oats or wheat in the, wheat in the winter. And then we removed the hay in the spring, the oak and wheat hay, took that off site. And then at the end of the summer growing season, we took off the grass hay because we wanted, in essence, a very hungry hay pasture below each one of our operations. Uh, no additional fertilizer was placed on, on the BTA, so these aren't waste application fields. The only runoff and nutrients are coming from the operation above. And again, to assess um, whether this BTA runoff was as clean or how, how well it compared to the local benign water quality, we established a control site at each one of the, the sites as well. Uh, this is an overhead view of, of the, the schematic um, with the BTA. So all the operations are pretty similar. The operation up here, water runs down slope and hits berms here in here and it's to a flume where we measure the, the VTA and the water quality coming into the VTA. This is a pipe coming from the, their farrowing house and so we measure that input as well. After the collection site, we spread the flow back out through gated pipes so that water could run uniformly down the field, be collected by berms and runoff as well. This was the, the toughest engineering part, and if it wasn't for the study, you know, the producer wouldn't have this berm here, the, the water would just run uniformly down the slope. So that took a, a little bit of engineering there. This is a, the picture of one of the sites, it's the bigger site, which take that with a grain of salt because we're only talking about a, a one acre VTA. So again, very, very small operations. These are some of the outdoor pins here, uh, the ferrying house and some of the indoor pins here. And so runoff runs, hit the berms, we measure the water quality and flow volume here, and then it runs down to the, the end of the field where we measure the water quality as well. And this one's the largest one, average about 50 animals, that changes quite a bit throughout the year. This is another site uh, pretty close to Texas A&M University. Um, again, similar design at all the sites, runoff from the operation, comes in here, we measure it, spread it back out, and it runs off at the edge of the field there. This is again about a one acre VTA, but a, a few lower, little lower animal population. And this site's the one that I guess you could say has some sort of solids pretreatment. Uh, the, the source area here is they open this uh, door quite a bit and then wash out the indoor pins. Um, they also have a walking pin on this side of the building. But a lot of the times of the year they, they use wood shavings in this operation. They actually just take the wood shavings out and burn it. So it's a uh, I guess that solids pretreatment. <laughs> so, uh, certainly uh, talked about Clean Air Act versus Clean Water Act issues. Uh, certainly applies here. Uh, but you'll see when I show the numbers that this was a site that was almost hard for me to generate a source of nutrients. And you'll see that in the numbers. Um, but you can see, you know, that's a healthy BTA. We've got the runoff occurring here through, you know, very dense standing vegetation and, and running off the field here. With that, my expertise in water quality sampling, um, and it, it's, I guess, surprising to me to some degrees to 
to hear about all the grab sampling done by the previous researchers, and, and I'm not critical of that at all, but we've done a lot of work to try to develop water quality monitoring systems that are low cost and effective at actually getting data that, that are a little more meaningful than just grab sampling, so I'd love to, to help you with some of that because that's an issue we face in all our research is how to get high quality data with, with limited research funds. So we're using automated equipment. We sample every drop of runoff that comes through, in essence, with uh, composite flow-weighted sampling. So we get the event mean concentration. That's a handy number to have because you multiply it by the runoff volume and you get the load of whatever constituent you're working with. And we analyze all the samples for nitrate, nitrogen, ammonium, orthophosphate, phosphorus, total P and total N. And I, but I don't, we're also measuring E. coli, I'm just going to focus on the nutrients today. But is there any questions about the water quality monitoring? Be happy to answer those. The soil sampling, I believe one of the questions earlier was about soil buildup, a buildup of nutrients in the soils, and so that was a question for us as well. So we're sampling each one of the fields twice a year uh, in the grid so we can see if, not only if uh, the spatial distribution, but the vertical distribution in the soil horizon as well. So I'm going to skip straight to some results and we can spend some, quite a bit of time on this slide if you would like. Um, these lower numbers here on the bottom end are quite a bit lower than the, the published estimates or for efficiencies on other uh, VTAs. Um, I think a lot of that's because we don't have the solids pretreatment, so we do have quite a load coming into these VTAs. Um, but on the upper end, really that's, those are pretty good numbers, pretty um, highly effective as far as, as nutrient reductions. What we saw that has been seen by a lot of other studies though is that on some of the storms and some of the median nitrate levels actually increased. They were higher at the VTA than they were at the VTA in. Uh, again, not as surprising based on the, the previous literature. So with that result, I would say that we are fairly effective at reducing the nutrient loads and concentrations and some of the, the runoff volumes as well. Would ask you to focus on the Bell County and Brazos County because maybe those are the more typical numbers. And, and I focus on uh, milligrams of liter for, for orthophosphorus. And, and again, the result was fairly common across all constituents. So we had high values coming in, as you would expect, direct runoff from a from a, a you know a holding pin of a pig operation, and, and quite a reduction, an order of magnitude reduction at the VTA out. Um, and these most of the time were statistically significant differences, so this would be an A for you scientists that care more about letters than you do the data. Um, so that's a sad statement, but uh, you get some giggles sometimes. But, uh, um, but the control site is still quite a bit lower. So if, again, this would probably be an A and a B and a C here. Okay? The Robinson site's the one where we took some of the uh, shavings off and burned them. Very low source, if you will. Um, and still reductions and probably significant reductions, but, but very low numbers to start with and more similar to the background numbers. Show a little bit about soil nutrients. Again, these are the distribution pipes on both sides and you can see a little bit of, of buildup here in the upper corners of both nitrogen. You know, it's kind of hurrying here, but you see 51 parts up here and really less than 10 for the most of it. The pipes dump a lot of solids at the corners there, so that's pretty much expected, I think. And then a pretty similar pattern for a phosphorus, a little build up here in the corners, but really none throughout the VTA. I thought I would see high numbers here, you know, moderate numbers here and low numbers here, but we just haven't seen that yet after two years of data collection. So here's the, maybe more the interactive part. You know, did this VTA work? And that's a question I'm still struggling with. So runoff N and P were much less um, at the VTA out than they were at the VTM. So we reduced nutrient concentrations. There's little or no buildup of soil N and P. So did these things work? Well, maybe the VTA out was still greater than the control site. So I don't know, I want to get your thoughts on that. Because that's really the issue here. I think the bigger issue is, is ag producers and, and ag industry are we doing what we need to do to take care of water quality? We assume that our benign rural land use is okay. 
but short of edge of field water quality standards, which nobody wants. Um, how do we answer that question? Did we do enough with these BTAs? Anybody got any ideas on that? And to me, that's the million dollar question. And that's what I plan on spending probably my next five years really diving into that issue. I see puzzled looks about like I get when I think about this issue. And so uh, to conclude, a couple years of data so far, we want to go at least two to two more, hopefully. We did see significant reductions through the VTA, a little or no buildup of nutrients, which are positive results. Um, we think that the intensive haying is helping with that. Um, solids management definitely reduced the loads in and out of the VTA at that one site. Um, some of the small operators would probably be willing to do that, not all of them. Um, but maintaining that perennial grass cover over season and winter was definitely an important component. Um, we probably should have better considered nutrient loads coming in, estimated loads, and not just worried about size of the VTA versus size of the source area. But I think because of, again, the limitations and the practical nature of this study, it was probably a decent um, assumption to make. If we made a big enough VTA, we'd be okay. Um, so instead of worrying about solids treat, treatment, I think if we increase the area, it seems to be a, a reasonable assumption. And initial data say that this is potentially a, an effective management technique, um, again, considering the practical nature and the low cost uh, of it. So with that, this is my contact information. Um, Kevin Wagner that I pointed about earlier is Associate Director of TWRI and now that I do have some time I can brag on him. He, he does as good of a job as anybody I know in the country on bringing teams together to solve research um, problems and we're lucky to have you in our state bringing teams together. Um, with that I'll be quiet and uh, take a couple of questions. Yes sir. So I assume most of the nutrient that you that have been reduced goes into the soil but the plant people it's a small percentage and so do you monitor your soil? The phosphorus probably keep going higher and higher and higher every year. You know, at some point your soil nutrient content will be really a problem. Yeah, we thought it would, but we're not seeing that build up yet. Now again, we've just gone two years, uh, but we're measuring both the six inch and the, the 12 inch. And so we're not seeing the build up yet, but I, I have, my gut feeling tells me that we're not taking off enough nutrients in hay that we won't see that build up eventually. But we've also got a very large treatment area and the only source of nutrients is that runoff. So I, I'm like you, I get the feeling that we might see that more in the future. Uh, but also we have very new VTAs and I don't think the vegetation is as healthy as it will be in four or five years. So in our parts of Texas, we can get three or four hay cuttings. And so maybe we will be able to keep up, but uh, so that's yet to be seen. Is, is the vegetation is, is similar, the same, it's a mixed vegetation or it's just always one 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 tap during the winter and one tap during summer yeah. or two of the, mix it up. Did you yeah, the, um, yeah sorry about that the, the first question was just about assumption of a buildup of nutrients and the second one was more about the vegetation the the two of the vtas have sort of a native grass cover <coughs> overseeded with oats or wheat and one of them is a coastal bermuda field so with the overseeding and with normal rainfall patterns we, we probably can get four cuttings of hay a year and uh, Maybe we can keep up with the nutrients. I hope so, but that's yet to be seen. Yes? Yeah, I think, so you didn't have any solid settling, right, and initially before I went to the VTA. So do you think Correct. that maybe might explain a lot of your reductions of phosphorus in the surface removal? Yeah, so, so the, the only site that had any kind of removal was the one placed with the wood chips, you know, the bedding or the wood shaping bedding. So the rest of it, yeah, it was just straight runoff. So there was no removal of nutrients except for the rainfall runoff. So it carried, certainly carried a lot of solids into the VTA. And were you so. able to measure the soluble, like phosphorus as compared to the sediment bound as to the difference in removal there? Yeah, that just... We have that data, I did get through the total P and then the, the soluble, and really the, the numbers weren't that much different. Uh, I've got all the data, just trying to figure out what to, to do in 20 minutes. But uh, I, there, wasn't a, a, there, there wasn't as much difference between constituent types as I thought I would see, to tell you the truth. I don't think any treatment system is designed to be 100% effective. Mm -hmm. So the assumption that you have to match your control 
I don't know that that's right. I mean, a wastewater treatment plant isn't designed to be a hundred percent effective. And I don't know of any system. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I assume, but I bet there are some people that would, that would disagree with us. So, but we, that's a question we've got to answer. How effective is it? How much is enough as a societal question? Exactly. But I think they have to, other people have to tell us that. Yeah, I agree. You know, I'm still amazed that most of our water quality papers that are published still talk about a 10 part per million drinking water standard, which really has nothing to do with it. But how many of them have that number just because there's a number? So, I, I hear you. <laughs> Did you have a yeah, I, I just want to know the person who's burning uh, uh, waste. What are they doing with the ash? We'll come talk about that. You know, again, this is the this is the operation that has eight to ten animals, and they've got a burn pile this big, and so we're talking about tiny operations.